Uh, today I'm going to do a demonstration for you of what pump recirculation looks like and we'll uh, have a demonstration of different dip tube configurations and setups on the drum. In order to give a better demonstration of what we're talking about when we talk about pump recirculation, we have a piece of equipment here that allows us to look inside the drum so we can see what's going on. This is a clear acrylic container containing DI water. Um, and we use this to visualize the flow patterns and uh, recirculation that can be generated by the uh, pump recirculation. Now, it's very difficult to see any type of flow in DI water. It's clear, you don't have any reference, so you can't really see it moving around very well. One of the things we do, and this is something that we've also used for visualizing mechanical agitation, where we have a prop, prop mixing inside the container, uh, we use hard plastic beads to visualize the flow inside the container. Now, for pump recirculation, the beads are not very effective. Um, they sit on the bottom. Pump recirculation is not designed to move heavily settled solids. It will not move heavily settled solids. However, I like to put them in here just as an uh, example of why we don't recommend pump recirculation for heavy, heavily settled materials. So our, our design here is very, very simply put, we have the uh, top of a drum, which we've removed and mounted to the top of our clear cylinder. We have a separate feed and return configuration on the dispense heads and dip tubes. These are using uh, Integris QC2s. Um, I'm gonna put the beads in there so you can see exactly how it would work if we did have heavy solids. And when we start off, pump recirculation. So as you can see, at the bottom of the drum, the Feed and return dip tubes are not effective in moving the heavily settled solids that are on the bottom of the drum. Uh, you can see the feed side is not sucking them up into the pump, and the return side will displace them away from the, the bottom, but doesn't do a very good job in other areas of the drum. This is the, the reason that we go through and do the testing that we do in our commercialization process to determine which type of agitation is best suited for a particular slurry. For slurries with heavy settling, pump recirculation is not recommended. We have a way to look at it so we can see that it is effective in rehomogenizing stratified slurries which don't have heavy settling. And I'll show you that next. We'll be using dye today. Um, red dye at the top of the container and blue dye at the bottom of the container to visualize the flow inside the drum during pump recirculation. When the overall volume of slurry turns purple, we know that we've done a good job of homogenizing the top and the bottom of the drum. So we'll start the recirculation and you can see that process as it occurs. It's kind of a slow process. As we discussed earlier, there is a, a thing that I've seen in the industry a lot, and that's using a QC2 dispense head for both feed and return. Um, it's not something we recommend, especially for slurries that can be sensitive to shear damage. Um, and I've reconfigured my apparatus here to show you exactly why 
we don't like that and why it's a bad idea. So as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of shear from the slurry going back through the half inch fitting, through the torturous path inside the dispense head and out the small orifices and being injected back into the drum at high velocity and literally spraying back into the container. Um, this type of recirculation can damage delicate slurries, especially those with uh, fume silicas or some polymer components, and it can cause extreme foaming. Uh, I won't demonstrate that with this configuration. I'll show you what that looks like a little bit later on with a, uh, with a different dispense head and return combination. Here we've reconfigured the pump apparatus, so we're using a feed and return combined dispense head. Um, what you can see is the flow pattern is such that the slurry is being pulled out through the center line and returned through an outer sheath that's located uh, concentric to the, the feed line on the outside of the dip tube. The flow pattern is slightly different in that the material is being pulled from the bottom and being returned to the center of the drum. This is actually a, a good setup to minimize splashing and foaming um, in the slurry. However, if you do have a slurry that foams a lot, once you get below the level of the return, you'll start to see foaming generated. And I'll demonstrate that again. Okay, right now I'm switching from a Integris QC3 feed and return dispense head to a Container Technologies feed and return dispense head. So this is a configuration that could be used with mechanical agitation and a non-foaming slurry. The mechanical agitator becoming in this side of the container and this would be acting as a feed return so you could have pump recirculation and mechanical agitation at the same time. As you can see, there's still a little bit of uh, foaming, but it's not nearly as constrained, it's not nearly as high pressure as what you'd see on the QC2 design. Um, this, again, would be suitable for slurries that have settling characteristics where you'd want to have mechanical agitation but didn't have any concern about foaming. The other option to reduce the amount of uh, velocity the slurry is being returned in is to slow down the pump. However, this will increase the amount of recirculation time you want to give it overall in order to get that turnover's worth of recirculation. For each of our slurries, we have an individualized mixing and handling document for that particular slurry. This information is something that we determine here during the commercialization process for each of the slurries. And we try and implement in such a way that it has the best possible chance of working with the least number of potential issues for the customer using the slurry.